Hey everybody, I'm Robert Evans, and this is again Behind the Bastards, the show where we tell you everything you don't know about the very worst people in all of history. Now today, we have a very special guest indeed, my former co-worker and current friend slash friend worker, Michael S. Wame. Howdy y'all. Did I get that right? Swame here. That is correct. From the Cool Ranch. So I'll tell you all about the great crunchy taste of Doritos. We are eating Doritos. That's not like a joke or anything. Like it started out as an attempt to get money out of the Doritos people, and now we just eat a lot of Doritos. You're pounding them down. Yeah, it's delightful. It's great to be here, Robert. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for showing up. So, Michael, yeah. you and I worked together for a while, and now you are are the one of the head beans of the Small Beans Network. T R U. What? True. Oh, dat. Right. True dat tape. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, so today we're talking about the age of heroic commerce. Have you ever heard of this? No. And you, I asked for like a clue as to what we'd be talking about. And you said it's the age of heroic commerce. And I resisted so strongly the urge to look it up. So I'm coming in fully cold. All I right. do not know what you're talking about. Well, yeah, that is uh, you've hit upon, as I should have explained a few seconds earlier, the premise of the show, which is that I read a story about someone terrible or someone's who are terrible. Uh, to a comedian guest who's coming in uh, cold. So mm-hmm. uh, we're going to start in on that right now. Nice. Actually, first off, I'm going to open a Diet Coke, and I'm going to do like a theatric open. So, oh, my God. No matter who you are or what your personal stance on uh, politics and capitalism is, you probably have a corporation, at least one, that you regard as evil. Maybe it's Monsanto. Maybe it's AT&T's Warner Media, the parent of CNN, if you're the president. Uh, Perhaps you hate Blackwater, now XE, or perhaps you hate News Corp, or uh, maybe you're not a fan of Twitter because they banned your favorite conspiracy theorist. Everybody hates at least one corporation these days. Build-a-bear workshop. (laughs) Build-a-bear. You've got a real problem with them. It's so angry. I feel like there's not just a story, but like a solid two seasons of stories and the explanation for that. (laughs) Yeah, it's for another day. Uh, So, yeah, we've all got a corporation we hate. Uh, And hatred of a corporation or corporations feels like a pretty modern thing, right? You have trouble imagining someone in like 1605 yelling about the corporation. Giving a shit at all. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But the reality is that tens of millions of people have all over the world, with very good reason, been hating on big business since the 1600s. In fact, even with all the nightmarish climactic fuckery of modern oil corporations, the scandals of the tobacco industry, and the vast sea of eating disorders caused by the fashion industry in Hollywood, corporate evil may have reached its peak so far more than 200 years ago. So join me, won't you, on a magical tour of a period of time the author Stephen R. Bowne calls the Age of Heroic Commerce. His book, Merchant Kings, has been one of the major sources for this episode. So, uh, the idea of working with several other people to run a business goes back a very long time, thousands of years, right? Probably to the beginning of currency and cities and stuff. I think Zildjian Symbols started that. Whoa. The oldest incorporated business still in existence. That's cool. Yeah. How, how old do they go back? <laughs> I'd have to look it up, but I just know they tout that fact, and I've verified it online. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the idea of you know running a business with a bunch of people, that goes back a long time. Sure. But a corporation is a different matter. Um, because for most of human history, there was nothing that you would want to do that would require more than you know a couple of rich people working together in order to provide the funding. and, and The they, funding. I was like, the rich yeah. people wouldn't be doing the work. No, never, <laughs> right? never, okay. never, yeah. never, never, never. Like, yeah. at no point in history, obviously. But you mean you're like, we don't need to put ink to paper on this. We're three rich dudes with money. We'll do the thing. Yeah, you yeah. didn't need, like, if you wanted to run a factory at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Like, it was it would just a couple of rich guys could fund it. You right. didn't need, it didn't take resources of huge numbers of people and, like, vast capital. That makes stuff. sense. You know, anything that did, that was generally the province of a state, you mm-hmm. know, a national government or whatever. Rome built the roads as a government, not as a okay. bunch of business enterprises, right? The great granddaddy of all modern corporations was the Dutch East India Company. It was first formed in 1602. Uh, it was a chartered company, so basically a bunch of people who didn't know each other all paid in so they'd get a share of the profits from this business. Uh, And in the case of the Dutch East India Company, its business was achieving a monopoly on all of the spices that came from India and Southeast Asia. So we're talking like mace. We're talking... Mace is a cooking spice? Yeah, sure is. Is it related to mace, like the weapon mace? I think it's probably why the spray has its name. Okay. But uh, there's also nutmeg and uh, cloves. Oh, yeah. You don't want to get nutmeg sprayed in your eyes. It's rough. It's... That happened to you a lot? All the time. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Had a lot of... (laughs) Try to sneak a cookie. Mom just goes nuts with the nutmeg. (laughs) (laughs) 
So yeah, now that kind of stuff you buy for like 89 cents from Trader Joe's in a big tube. But back in the day, it was worth enough that like if you had a backpack of nutmeg and you like landed in London yeah. in the 1600s, you were a rich man. It's crazy that like Disney or Facebook, any of the big companies you could name, back then the big company that had that much money and clout was just like, Food is so fucking bland. <laughs> yeah. This will fix that. Everything like, sucks in oh, Europe. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, finally. <laughs> Here's all the money. Well, and all of the spices that we've talked about so far come from or are only located in a chunk of Indonesia called the Banda Islands. These are known as the spiceries. So Where do like, they get all the spices? They just had yeah, them all. That was the only place Providence, nutmeg grew. Yeah. yeah, only place cloves grew. Wow. Um, so, yeah, the Dutch East India Company is formed to try and gain a monopoly on the trade of all the spices from those delightful islands. Uh, now, it started out with a 21-year charter, so it was supposed to be dissolved and the money given back to its original formers after that point. But it wound up getting its charter extended over and over again and eventually lasted more than two centuries. So this is a company that, wow. that had a long history. The Dutch East India Company was the first publicly traded corporation in the world, and the first stock market in history was created to sell its stock. It's because if they were the first publicly traded, they had to invent the idea yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is when people were like, stock markets, that's <laughs> a thing like, we should have. This is doing so well, we <laughs> should make paper that represents a portion of it and just sell that. Yeah. We don't and, even need the spices. And let people gamble on whether it'll be worth more or less at the end of the day. Yeah, wow. And then let that run our entire society. So these are, I mean, these are capitalist visionaries. Yeah. Sure, this is yeah. the beginning of capitalism. I will say the only, <laughs> maybe mild spoiler alert, I don't know. Mm -hmm. The only thing I recall about the Dutch East India Company is that I read a small plaque about it in the Slavery Museum. So that may, there's some thread there possibly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's okay. some thread there, although they're not like the number one I'll brace group myself. for that. Uh, we'll get to that later. So according to a book called The Honorable Company, which is about the British East India Company. So there's the Dutch and the British East India Company, two different companies. Almost the same name. Yeah. Are they and, competing yeah, with oh, each other? Okay. And how, buddy? Okay. <laughs> so the British East India Company received its royal charter on the 31st of December in 1600, so two years before the Dutch East India Company. Its original name was the Company of Merchants of London Trading into the East Indies. Now, that original name, which is not very clickable, yeah. uh, may inform you that it was not the same thing as the Dutch East India Company to start. Rather than being a modern corporation, it was basically a bunch of independent ventures under the same name. Okay. So like a bunch of different individual boats going over to these islands, getting spices and bringing them back, all profiting independently, just sort of marketed under the same name. Why did they benefit? It's just like easier to all be under one name? Yeah, that's what they the thought public. at the time. Sure. Yeah, the company itself had no, unlike the Dutch East yeah. India Company, had no ability to invest money in new projects or decide how its funds were used across its many ventures. Gotcha. So the British East India Company, when it starts off, is not like a modern corporation. Now, a few decades later, in 1670, the Hudson Bay Company, which still exists today, is formed uh, and winds up gaining control of like most of Canada. It's why we have Vancouver. Vancouver started as like a corporate outpost for this company. Imagine so a meeting is... today for that company and you're like, well, how are we doing? Well, we used to own most of Canada. <laughs> this quarter we made $800,000. How's that? <laughs> That's quite a legacy. Once the whole Northwest <laughs> yeah. was all domain, yeah. but we're doing okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Up one and a half percent. Exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, so th th that's just to give you an idea of sort of this is when the idea of running corporations starts to take off and people are trying various different things. And not all of these companies are quite like modern companies. The Dutch East India Company is the one that from the start is really recognizable as a modern corporation in terms of its its formulation and the way yeah. that it functions. Um, so for an idea of what made it so special, I'd like to turn to an article from the global trade magazine called The Violent Birth of Corporations. This is why corporations were so different from what had existed before. They were anonymous. The partners did not all have to know each other. They separated ownership from control. Elected directors made decisions while most investors had only the choice of accepting those decisions or selling their shares. They were permanent. If one or more partners did want out, there was no need to renegotiate the whole arrangement. Finally, they were legal entities separate from any one owner, and they had unlimited life. The big trading partnerships of the 16th century and earlier were created with a planned date of dissolution, sometimes at the end of one voyage, sometimes after a set number of years, at which point all the firm's holdings would be liquidated and divided among the partners. The new firms, like modern corporations, did not self-liquidate. They built up their capital over the years rather than distributing it back to its separate owners. So they have now created an immortal being 
that yeah. <laughs> yeah. has pretty wide ranging powers, as we'll start to get to. The corporation. The as corporation. An abstract. Yeah. It sounds like the Guild of Calamitous Intent from Venture Brothers. A little like, bit, right? It's because they're ahead of the curve as far as any regulation, mm-hmm. obviously. So they all get to be anonymous from even yeah. each other. They're just like, Mr. X has <laughs> charted this mission. Yeah, it's just the company has charted this exactly. mission. So yeah, there are some people we'll get into who are very critical in the, the big operations players. of this. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so for the first 200 years, you know, from 1600 to 1800 of the corporate era, there were almost no corporations meant to service the needs of inter-European trade or based solely within a single nation. So for two centuries, the job of a corporation was not operating stores or designing new products. It was plunder and conquest of the known and unknown world. Like, that's why we made corporations. Right. The yeah. only business that existed was yeah. exploration and conquest. Well, the only business that, that required was big enough. Incorporation, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. You don't need a corporation to sell clothes to people on the other side of the fin from you and Right, middle of gross England or wherever. You just have like handshake deals with people who own carts and shit. <laughs> yeah, or like small businesses where it's like a shop right, and the shop sells right. the hats and you get the hats from the shop or whatever. I just wonder who managed the, who's the first person to be like, I'm a stockbroker. I'll manage the stock of this single company and track its ups and downs. I mean, it's sort of like evolved naturally because you start out with these things that weren't really corporations, but they had stock and they were for a limited time. And their people start, you know, once that becomes a thing. Initially, it's just a right. way for you to get your profits from the deal. But eventually, people start selling and trading the stock. <laughs> and once there's snowballs. five stocks yeah. instead of just one stock, they're like, we need a building to yeah. talk about the stocks. We in. should have yeah. an exchange. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it snowballs at some point. Or my name's not John Nasdaq. (laughs) (laughs) So the main reason that corporations were necessary was essentially that violence was necessary in the business of international trade. Operating boats and trading stations cost a lot of money, but the real cost came because in order to force people to trade sometimes, you needed to wage war on the native peoples who had the resources you wanted. It was also necessary because these corporations all wanted monopolies on the areas they were trading in. So corporations would fight corporations. So you needed money not just to take products from one area to the other, not just to operate factories, but to operate navies and to operate land armies and to wage war against other corporations and against the local peoples who didn't want to give you their stuff. Uh, So that's why corporations are necessary. It's staggering to imagine how profitable this must have been for the home country government for them not to give a shit. Like that private citizens, you know, are amassing a navy (laughs) and be like, well, just let them do it. They'll pay millions and millions of dollars. That's how it starts. As we'll cover, it gets more complicated. (laughs) Uh, But at the start, yeah, the Dutch and British East India companies were not just licensed to trade. They had a literal license to kill. They had a power to declare war, uh, and they did so regularly. Like without governmental approval? Yeah, yeah. None none necessary whatsoever. Wow. Now, it didn't start out violent. In late 1601, the British East India Company was the first corporation in the spiceries, you know, these islands in Indonesia that are just filled to fucking bursting with Mm -hmm. delightful spices. Spices like the delicious spices Mm -hmm. on this Cool Ranch Doritos chip that I'm going to fortify myself with before getting into the rest of this. Oh, yeah. You, mm. That's that malic acid you're tasting. <laughs> <laughs> we should find the island they grow that acid on. I mean, monosodium <laughs> cultures all day. <laughs> mm. That's a good Dorito. So in late 1601, when the British East India Company winds up there, uh, it's actually pretty peaceful. You know, there's no other corporations around yet. The native islanders are pretty peaceful people. The vast majority of gunpowder expended by the British East India Company is used saluting. Like, they'll pass a port, or they'll pass another ship, and they'll fire into the air. And so most of the people who die at this point die in saluting accidents. (laughs) Just bullets (laughs) randomly raining down on them. Here's a quote from the Honorable Company. The indiscriminate firing of a few pieces, often on the flimsiest of pretexts, would account for a good many lives. So much so that in London, the directors would be moved to protest that it was quite unnecessary to salute every port, every passing vessel, every sailor, every imaginable anniversary. Yet, if anything, the practice (laughs) grew and there was probably more powder expended in ceremony than in battle. Oh my god. Yeah. So oh, that... it's National Peach Day. Shoot at those guys. <laughs> Shoot the cannons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> Which is a very male thing to do. We've got cannons. Yeah. We're on a boat and We're it's stocked boring. with gunpowder. Yeah, yeah. What the fuck are we supposed let's, to do? Let's shoot some stuff. Yeah. So the Honorable Company tells the story of a Captain Brand of a boat named the Ascension who, quote, had the unusual misfortune of being shot by the guns of his own ship. In somber mood, he was rowed ashore to attend the funeral of the Red Dragon, another boat's mate, 
when the Ascension's gunner let fly with the usual three-gun salute for a deceased officer. Unfortunately, the gunner, being not so careful as he should have been, had forgotten that his guns were loaded and that the captain was within range. One ball scored a direct hit and slewed the captain and the boatswain's mate stark dead, so that they went to see the funeral of another and were both buried themselves. Oh, I miss the ocean, dude. <laughs> well, they were supposed to just put powder in the cannons, right. so it made no. But they just left the ball in and shot the captain. Oh my god! So it's a little bit of a slapdash operation at the start. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it's just a pack of mercenaries with no yeah. training. Oftentimes, these corporations started off with a name like the Adventurers Association mm-hmm. of whatever, because it's just guys with guns going out to get <laughs> yeah. rich, like. I don't think it's a coincidence that their initials are THC. That's all I'm saying. Oh, shit. Wait, are they? <laughs> the Honorable Company? I oh, yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a nickname for him. But yeah. Right. But that would be a nickname later. They well, weren't... that's what my dealer calls himself. That's all I'm saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> weird dude. Yeah, it's weird that you have a dealer in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It seems unnecessary, yeah. but I'm a traditionalist. Feels like you're man. complicating matters. I like <laughs> awkwardly hanging out with a weird dude to get my weed. <laughs> to give him $60 yeah. for a bag of. Yeah. Speaking of giving people too much money for a tiny amount sure. of spices. Sure. Good segue. Yeah. So uh, around 1608, 1609, the Dutch East India Company makes it to the spiceries, right? Now, they had a charter to establish a monopoly on spice trading in Asia and India. Things have been peaceful up to this point, but now that the Dutch were here, they decided they didn't want any English assholes buying and selling spices from the same islands that they were. Uh, So in 1609, Admiral Peter Verhoeven, I'm assuming the ancestor of Paul Verhoeven. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm uh, hoping for. Took 13 warships to the Banda Islands, the world's only source of nutmeg and mace. Here are the orders his corporate masters sent him with. We draw your special attention to the islands in which grow the cloves and nutmeg, and we <laughs> instruct you to strive after winning them for the company either by treaty or by force. The precious. <laughs> the precious <laughs> nutmeg. Thousands will bleed for the <laughs> nutmeg. <laughs> yeah, like what are you willing to die for? Oh, nutmeg for sure. <laughs> for sure. 100% that's, I'll die for nutmeg. That's number one with a bullet. Yeah. Or a cannon shot, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Admiral Verhoeven took with him an army of 1,000 soldiers, including Japanese mercenaries with swords meant to be used as executioners to enforce corporate will through terror. If this isn't in the 1600s, it sounds 100% like a <laughs> cyberpunk story. Also, had the natives in that area been <laughs> rebellious or like stood up for themselves? Or are they going in like, uh, we're going to need some executioners. Let's just, it'll be nice to have them. They think it's, it'll be nice to have them. Yeah. And he's planning to fuck with the British. Okay, and, and you want some samurai if you're really gonna murder British people. Sure, like, but then the anniversary of something comes along and they accidentally just, <laughs> just execute they each kill other. Everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Verhoeven's big enemies are yeah the British East India Company and the Portuguese. So he wants to expel basically everyone who's not the Dutch East India Company from the Spice Islands and have because he who controls the spice right. controls the dinner table. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Now Adib is going to come in here. (laughs) On April 19th, 1609, the Admiral came ashore on the largest of the Banda Isles with 250 men. He handed out gifts to the assembled natives and told them that they had, quote, broken their promise to trade only with the Dutch. As a result, he said, the company was building a fort and a permanent factory on the island to keep track of things. Then he went around to all the different tribal chiefs and had them sign agreements, which none of them could read, to give his company a monopoly on the nutmeg trade from their island. The islanders did not take well to this. For one thing, he just had all the chiefs on one island sign an agreement, and then he tried to enforce it on all the islands, and they were like, we're different countries, basically, mm-hmm. dude. Like, we don't work that way. And for another thing, no one in the Banda Islands understood why they should agree to give any company a monopoly over their stuff. The goods he tried to buy them off with were basically wool and velvet, neither of which was useful for people on tropical islands. So they were like, <laughs> what are we getting out of this? But yeah, Verhoeven keeps taking islands, so in, in a little bit later, he lands with 750 of his troops on another island, Niera, and he starts building a big fort. The local people decide to take matters into their own hands, and we're going to get into how the local people fight back against sort of corporate encroachment, mm-hmm. uh, but first, we have another kind of corporate encroachment oh. that will not result in the destruction of <laughs> island cultures. We'll see. We'll see. Probably not. You can't guarantee that. No, actually, I will. I will guarantee none of the sponsors of this show are going to destroy islands in Indonesia. Robert doesn't speak for both of us. (laughs) I think it's ads time. And we're back, and we are talking about Admiral 
Peter Verhoeven of the Dutch East India Company and his attempts to build a monopoly in the Spice Islands. So he's landing on islands. He's signing agreements with the people on islands. He's building his self some forces, and he's just landed on the island of Nero with 750 men, and he starts building a giant fortress so that he can stop anyone else from trading with the island. The local people invite the admiral to parley in the middle of nowhere to talk to him about sort of the limitations of this agreement, and he obliged them, bringing along two chained-up English prisoners as a sign of his dominance over the British East India Company. To be like, right. check out what a boss I am. I've got these dudes <laughs> yeah. in chains who yeah. aren't Dutch, but probably look the same to you because <laughs> we're all Europeans. Like Bob Iger showing up to the Lucasfilm negotiations <laughs> with like, look at this dude from Time Warner. I got chained <laughs> over here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe with his... His lips sewn together. I imagine sure. Bob Iger sews a lot of people's lips together. That I could see that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, when the Admiral and his men arrived at the meetup point, they found it empty. Uh, so the Admiral sent out a scout who found some locals hiding and apparently terrified in the woods. Uh, here's a quote from the book Merchant Kings. They informed him that they had become frightened at the sight of so many armed Dutchmen. Would Verhoeven please leave his soldiers, arms, and guns under the tree, bringing only his senior negotiators to them so that they could talk safely without the soldiers shadowing the talks? So this is a sign of how arrogant these Europeans are. Fairhoven's like, of course. And <laughs> then his second in command, Admiral Akbar, like, it's a trap. And he's like, shut up, Akbar. We're going in. Yeah. You're always wrong. Yeah. <laughs> the prisoner's like, oh, mate, I don't think it's only up and up. Shut up, you filthy Englishman. <laughs> Dutch courage shall prevail. <laughs> so he goes for the meeting with a few dozen of his okay. uh, aides and stuff, and uh, they're all massacred. Yes. And the admiral's decapitated and his head is mounted on a stick. Just like in a Paul Verhoeven movie. <laughs> yeah, it's just great. like in a Paul yeah. Verhoeven movie. Uh, so this marked the start of a general uprising against the Dutch across the islands. Uh, luckily for the company, they had a thousand armed men and more than a dozen warships. Uh, so the next company leader, the guy who gets promoted when Verhoeven gets his head cut off, is a guy named Simon Hohen. And he immediately starts burning down villages, executing islanders, and stealing everything that isn't nailed down as revenge for the killings. Uh, his forces were eventually beaten in battle and had to flee to their boats, and but then they just enacted a naval blockade. And, you know, people had been trading with the Spice Islands for a while now, mm -hmm. so their population had grown. They'd been doing very well. They were no longer self-sufficient in terms of food. They required oh, trade from other islands and from outside, so this he just is, starts starving them. This is so Star Wars now. Yeah, yeah. A trade blockade <laughs> on Coruscant has prevented the spice from... Yeah. <laughs> Is it, this the long, long this ago is, Lucas was talking about? This is very episode one, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they got this naval blockade going, and it works. The locals surrender because they don't want to starve to death, and the entire island of Nera becomes property of the Dutch East India Corporation. In be, whose eyes? I mean, in, the, in everyone's like, eyes. Including the people of the island? This has so been like, a military conquest. Yeah, they surrendered. Okay. The company said, like, in the uh, agreement, it was stated, like, this is to be kept by us forever. Wow. Like, we just own this island now. And this is the first time that it happened. So Not a lot of leverage when it comes to trade. back to the trade table. So, no. look, I know you own us now, but the spices are still good, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, Hoenn sailed away from the Banda Islands, and the islanders went right back to trading with people they pleased, albeit just kind of quietly this time. Sure. So they haven't figured out force projection a yeah. lot yet, so the natives are still able to get away with some stuff, but the stage had been set for the Dutch East India Corporation's rise to power. By 1623, the end of its original 21-year charter, its forces had engaged in naval battles with every major sea power on the world. Because they're trading all around Asia and Europe at this point. They're going up into China. They're just sending boats everywhere, and they're constantly fighting with people. But this, Yeah, it's like the wire. Like It's inherent to trade that, well, when you get there, you're going to have to fuck some people up. You're going to have to shoot some people, yeah. Then you control the corner. <laughs> then you can start selling the product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and th this is a lot of companies will set up posts and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and they'll maybe conquer the post, but they weren't taking much land beyond that. Or fortresses, it sounds like, yeah, which fortresses. I'm imagining as flying steampunk fortresses, and please don't disappear. That, that's of that. perfectly yeah. fine. Yeah, no. But the, the Dutch East India Company starts actually trying to do more than that, trying to okay. actually rule land to an extent. And, you know, they're not good at it at first, but that's where their ambition starts to head. So... In addition to fighting the local peoples, they're also fighting the British East India Company at this point. You know, there are sort of fighting them in the market, but there's also like street fights in these towns and these islands yeah. between company representatives and stuff. And, you know, things gradually start to escalate. And this brings us to a guy named Jan Peterzoon Cohen. Uh, now, Cohen was born in 1587. He served as a junior merchant in Verhoeven's fleet. 
uh, mm-hmm. and distinguished himself by quite literally writing reports. Like he, he wrote really good reports on how to make more money in these islands. He was that guy. Uh, See, I think a guy who just makes his living writing these long reports is, you know, <laughs> fuck a guy like that. You know what I mean, Robert Evans? Uh, yeah, you, you hate that. Someone who just researches just shit. Sits around and then, researching oh, and type, type, typing away. Can't stand it. Mm-hmm. All right, so this guy I hate already. This guy you hate All, already. The only syllable I remember is Zune. Yeah, but... Cohen. Yeah, well, Peter Zune. Peter Zune. <laughs> okay. John Peter Zune. I'm not even going to try to pronounce John Dutch. John Peter Zune. So, by 1614, Cohen rose to become the second in command of the company's operations in the spiceries, which, to be fair, was as much about not dying of tropical disease as it was about merits, okay. other than that. Very <laughs> heart of darkness. It's like... <laughs> That's who, a real important point. Who's <laughs> at the top? Yeah. The British guy who hasn't died of malaria yet. Yeah. He was just born (laughs) immune to malaria, so he's the boss. Everyone else died in a month. Um, So Cohen starts looking over the broader economic situation in the spiceries, and one thing becomes very clear to him. And this is a quote from the book Merchant Kings. Spices grew in such abundance in these regions that there was no shortage of supply. Hence, competition from the English could not be tolerated because this would lower prices in Europe and make the business unprofitable. Ah. (laughs) <laughs> Which is literally like the epitome of evil because yeah. on the pull from empathy to it's like, yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's this thing everyone in the world wants. Mm-hmm. Oh, it turns out God has left such there's a bountiful so amount of it, of it yeah. that everyone could just have it and it's fine. Well, we better burn most of it, like keep it locked in this box. And they do that throughout yeah. this period. They will exterminate nutmeg from several of these other islands just to make it God. easier for them to control. Like they'd be like, well, these islands are too far off and we don't have enough ships to. So let's just kill all the nutmeg on them. So just that dudes it's with flamethrowers, burn the nutmeg. <laughs> no one else gets nutmeg. I gotta say. They're evil, but it smells delicious around here. <laughs> it's delightful, delightfully yeah. scented island. Yeah. yeah, so Cohen's solution was for the company to expand throughout the region and get a, you know, a total monopoly. Um, this way they'd have the power to restrict the supply of spices in Europe and thus always charge really high prices, which was necessary because they were running an increasingly large navy and army, and that shit don't come cheap. So in order to achieve this vision, Cohen called for the creation of an even larger corporate fleet so that he could assault the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Philippines and Macau and China. He also advocated sending Dutch colonists and slaves to colonize these newly conquered territories all throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, It was a beautiful dream, and the Council of Seventeen, who were the board of directors for this... I know, right? It sounds so sinister. This whole story is so, like, it should take place in the future instead of the past. This should be 300 years from now. Or maybe time is cyclical, because this really feels like what... Our corporate culture we currently have is going to return yeah, to, ultimately. Yeah. Like, people start sniping CEOs yeah. and shit. Yeah, this yeah. is going to happen. It sounds like in 20 years this will happen, but Again. most of the players yeah. will have robot arms. Exactly. Yeah, and it'll be cool as hell. It'll be better. Our yeah. version will be higher effects budget. Yeah, yeah. yeah. way higher effects budget. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the Council of 17 gets on board, but to actually achieve his goals, Cohen knew he would first have to kick the British out of the Banda Isles. Okay. So there's a bunch of different islands they're concerned with and a lot of other trading ports, but he he starts trying to really lock down the bandas. So two of the islands, I and Run, had not signed any kind of agreement with the Dutch. They were still free and independent. Here's how a book, The Honorable Company, describes the political situation in those islands at this point. In the best tradition of Southeast Asian Adat consensus, each village or island was in fact a self-governing and fairly democratic republic. They could withhold or dispose of their sovereignty as they saw fit, and whereas the inhabitants of neighboring Niera and Lanthor had already been bullied into accepting a large measure of Dutch control, those of outlying Ai and Run had managed to preserve their independence intact. So, so in other words, Ai Run so far away. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh. But why were they able to maintain that? Is that because they were militarily stronger or just remote? They were just further away. Okay. Yeah. So my flock of seagulls pun scans. Yes. Screw you. But I hate it, (laughs) and I'm not happy that you made it. And then it's on this episode. Anyway, it's happened. (laughs) It can be cut. It's happened. No, it's happened. All right. There's no cutting on this show. Good. Uh, So in 1615, the company under Cohen sent a thousand soldiers to I to subjugate the locals. The invasion was, however, defeated and repulsed because the natives had been armed with British guns and trained by British troops. Not troops of the British government, but mm. troops of the British East India Company. It begins. So, yes, multinational corporations were funding insurgent armies to fight each other 400 years in the past. Wow. Yeah, and the idea of governments just funneling guns to yeah. a convenient ally that you have no control over in the long mm-hmm. term. 
Just give them all our weapons. They'll do it for us. The It'll be fine. The real lesson of history is that no one has ever learned anything ever. <laughs> yeah, I always feel like, yeah, learn history so that you know what the repetition is going to be. Yeah. Not, or you're doomed to repeat it. You're doomed to repeat you're it. You're going to repeat it. Yeah, People yeah. only do the same thing. Right. Yeah. Just with bigger and bigger guns. Exactly. Yeah. See um, how that works out for us. <laughs> yeah. So, so the next year, Cohen sends another army to invade I. He also sent a message ahead of them to the English soldiers helping to defend the island, saying that, quote, if any slaughter of men happened, they would not be culpable. So the English company runs away because they don't want to die, and I gets conquered. Uh, so sci-fi. I'm sorry. Like, it's amazing, yeah. right? The honorable company and council of 17 <laughs> lay waste to I for spice. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's about to get wasted. Great. So, oh, no, bad. Yeah, no, it's terrible. Uh, now, at this point, the English are still active in Run and other islands in Indonesia. Uh, so Cohen's, you know, he's not finished kicking them out yet. He wrote a letter to the council of 17 around this point that inadvertently sums up the military-industrial complex today. Quote, Your honor should know by experience that trade in Asia must be driven and maintained under the protection and favor of your honor's own weapons, and that the weapons must be paid for by the profits from the trade, so that we cannot carry on trade without war, nor war without trade. And no, I don't under... <laughs> Everyone who lays the foundation of the military-industrial complex... How do you not scan that as, oh, and that seems bad? Oh, like, this might end really badly. <laughs> they're like, uh, sir, well, what's the report from the front? Well, we have chained our trade to violence and violence to trade in a never ending, only accelerating <laughs> freight train of who knows what will happen. Good, good report. <laughs> this Carry seems on. like a, an yeah. endless caught, like an endless yeah. road to more profits. Exactly. Feels like it'll never go badly for yeah, us. The gravy train will never stop. <laughs> yeah. This seems sustainable forever. <laughs> so on April 30th, 1618, uh, the company promotes Cohen to head of Eastern Operations and basically gives him a mandate oh, to. Congrats. Yeah. Well deserved. Yeah. I know, right? He got a plaque. He worked He's... so hard for it. He did. Yeah. He did. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's that cannon on National Broccoli he, Day. He missed his kids' Dutch <laughs> baseball games a lot, <laughs> yeah. uh, but you know, it was worth it in the end. I'm sure because mm -hmm. his kid's gonna go to Dutch Harvard. So yeah, uh, once Cohen was in total command, things quickly got even more violent. The fighting in the islands where sort of the Dutch and the British are still kind of holding an uneasy peace. You know, there are more and more street fights. There are more and more naval battles between the fleets of the corporations. Soldiers start fighting in the jungle, but sort of while Cohen is working on eliminating the last of the British from this area, the English and Dutch governments go behind his back and arrange a peace treaty for the two corporations and kind of force it on them because they're like, you're going to draw our countries into war. And yeah. like, England doesn't need to be at war with the with Netherlands. Over like, <laughs> spices that there's plenty of. A yeah. thousand miles away. We don't want this. So the All governments right. make peace. Break it up, fellas. Cohen is furious about this. Because if there's one thing he loves, it's fighting the British East India Corporation. And I love that this is like maybe the first time in history a human had the impulse, how dare the government regulate my corporation? <laughs> yeah. My corporation is more important than the government. I think this is where that yeah. begins. Because this is the first time that I'm aware of that a government really stepped into a multinational corporation mm -hmm. and was like, what the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. You're... There's so much nutmeg. Why are people dying? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Cohen, yeah, has to deal with the fact that the British East India Company is now his friend and ally. He grumbles about this, but he turns his attention to fucking over a completely different group of people, the remaining unconquered Banda Islands. Uh, so he assembles an invasion force, and he subjugates the remaining free indigenous people of the island chain. He burns their mosques. Uh, he requires them to pay taxes and sweet, sweet spices. Uh, and when certain people among the islanders fight back and start massacring his patrols and basically draw the company into a guerrilla war, Jan Piterzun Cohen goes scorched earth on their asses. Uh, he captures 45 tribesmen, beheads eight tribal elders in public, and then quarters the rest, which oh means he just cuts God. them in four. One officer working for Cohen at the time stated that, quote, things are carried on in such a criminal and murderous way that the blood of the poor people cries to heaven for revenge. So that's... One of his employees They're being like, like, we're the bad guys. Yeah. <laughs> this is really clear to me. And he's like, quarter that man. <laughs> yeah. He's quartering everybody. Yeah. Jesus, he's God. Fucking, I'll tell you one thing about Jan Peters and Cohen. He's always able to fucking clean his laundry because he's got quarters coming out the woof. <laughs> you nailed his name that time, too. Thank well, you. Well played. Thank you. Uh, so subjugation was not the only thing Jan Cohen was out for. His plan for the islands was, in essence, genocide. Here's how Merchant Kings describes it. Quote, 
He wanted to depopulate the islands to replace their inhabitants with imported slaves and indentured labor under company control. He proceeded with the ethnic cleansing of the Banda Islands. Over the next several months, company troops burned and destroyed dwellings, rounded up entire villages, and herding captives into ships so that they could be transported to Batavia and sold as slaves. Thousands of men, women, and children died of disease and starvation during the voyage. Out of a total population of perhaps 13 to 15,000, barely a thousand of the original residents remained in the Banda Islands. Holy shit. Yeah. How much right can you think you have to <laughs> reform the earth? That's crazy. Like showing up at a place and being like, yeah, let's move that over there, build these buildings, kill all these people. <laughs> Just all of them. Would it change your opinion, though? To know that there's a nutmeg. Yeah, what do they? That's <laughs> and, what I was, and cloves. I was Don't ask, you dare forget cloves. At home, are people outraged or are they just like, I love me them spices. Oh, they are nutmegging out hard. Really? And okay. they're building like the government gets taxes out of this right. and duties, and they're building nice new Hospitals buildings and, and yeah, stadia or what have you. If you're just a dude in the Netherlands, you're like shitload of money's coming in from over uh -huh. here. This and I'm like, sure your average person on the street in the 1600s doesn't have their app open yeah. going like, oh, all this shit's evil. No, <laughs> and, and by the height of the Dutch East India Corporation, it's responsible for something like half of all of the trade in Europe. Wow. So they become huge. Like, to the point where people just take it for granted. Like, well, yeah. they, they're just always there. They're McDonald's. What are you going to do? They're even, it would be fair to say, they're even bigger in this society as a force for like the life in commerce than Amazon is today. Like right. half of the trade. Like yeah. that, they are enormous. They're like Google's on. Yeah. yeah, and they just had to genocide some people. So you might think that for any rational man or even a moderately crazy genocidal man, this would have been enough. But it was not enough for Jan Peterson Cohen. He decided unilaterally to renege on the peace treaty with the British East India Company that his government had negotiated. He arrested all of the English people on the islands, tortured and executed a huge number of them, took all their goods and destroyed everything that they'd built. So, wow. Yes. He so he's not even because a lot of times evil bastards will have the ability to dehumanize foreign or exotic peoples, but he's he'll kill anyone. No one is a human to Jan Cohen. That's what I mean. Yeah. It's like he doesn't. It's not a thing where he has any justification. He's like, I'll kill anyone who opposes me. He doesn't. So just, not clear. He has fucks, but he took yeah. half of his fucks and he executed them in front of the other half of his fucks to keep them quiet. Exactly. Like, that's the man yeah. here. So we're going to talk more about Jan fucking Cohen. And then we're going to talk about a motherfucker named Robert Clive and a little subcontinent called India. All but right. first, mm -hmm. do you love products and services and using currency to purchase those things? You know it. That's oh. why I'm here. It's the best. Off we go! <laughs> And we're back. Uh, we're back, and we're talking about Jan Peterson and Cohen. Uh, Jan piece of shit Cohen. It's a real yeah. piece of shit. Real the piece of shittest Cohen there's ever <laughs> been. I wonder if the Cohen brothers. It yeah. would be weird Ethan if- Ethan Cohen's a real piece of shit, <laughs> it would, man. It would be weird if we've been talking about ancestors to both Paul Verhoeven and the Cohen brothers, the three greatest directors of all history. And they hear this, this and have a bare-chested fist fight to resolve the conflict. Or make this into a sweet-ass movie. <laughs> there you go. Because I think- if you're going to have the Coen Brothers and Paul Verhoeven team up on a movie. That's a bizarre is... team up. <laughs> you need Verhoeven for how yes, bloody this story right. is. You have the Coen Brothers direct like the peaceful native people and their their plight. And I okay. think you have Paul Verhoeven direct the Dutch. So like when, when, after the landing <laughs> yeah, happens. Yeah. So yeah, uh, Jan's corporate masters were angry that he had disobeyed them and massacred the British company. But he'd also guaranteed them sole world monopoly over nutmeg and mace, two of the most valuable things on the planet. Um, so they gave him history's first slap on the wrist corporate punishment mm -hmm. and also gave it to him with a gigantic bonus. Uh, so <laughs> a literal golden parachute. <laughs> yeah. Well, he stays on. No, they're not going to no, kick okay. him out. He's really good at this. <laughs> uh, so one of the company's directors looking out at the burnt farms and slave run plantations that had replaced a once thriving society in the Banda Isles said, quote, this is fine. This seems good to me. Oh, no. He said there is no profit at all in an empty sea, empty countries and dead people. That's I agree. Like what? The, at some point, if you burn everything the fuck down, where are you getting the nutmeg, dude? Well, he was right eventually, sure, because this all does collapse for the Dutch India Company. But for a while, it's super profitable, and the Dutch East India Company becomes the most powerful corporation on the planet. 
Cohen died of a horrible tropical disease in 1629 at age Score! Yep, at age 42, so he didn't last that long. Yeah. But the company lived on. By the end of the century, it had a private fleet of more than 150 merchant ships and 40 warships and employed 50,000 people across the world, including a 10,000-man private army. Uh, it eventually sank into decline and irrelevance, and by 1799, it was dissolved under a tremendous amount of debt. Uh, so yeah, the Netherlands continued to govern much of Indonesia until 1949, but the Dutch East India Company was not the most successful or the most notable East India Company in all of history. That title goes to the people they defeated in the battle for the Spiceries, the British East India Company. So, after Cohen massacred a bunch of their people in the Banda Isles back in 1623, the British East India Company had hit a wee bit of a rough patch. The company took on more and more debt and had to sell most of its assets in order to stay alive. The only reason it didn't get dissolved and go out of business is that it maintained a small trading post on India's northwest coast. Now, the company limped along through the 1630s and 1640s when Oliver Cromwell took away its royal monopoly over Indian trade at the same time as he took off the king's head. By early 1657, the British East India Company was near death and its governor suggested ending it altogether. But old Oliver Cromwell was like, wait a minute, <laughs> maybe this thing just needs a little tune-up. And he issued the company a new charter. It would again have a monopoly on trade within the Indies, but it would also have to organize itself differently. So, as I said before, the Dutch corporation had been similar in organization to today's corporations. You know, it accumulated wealth, invested it on projects, and was able to, you know, operate the way a company operates. Mm -hmm. The British East India Company had not functioned that way. The new charter was basically a ripoff of the Dutch East India Company's organizing principle so that it could compete with a company like that and develop an effective navy and army. The government even ceded the reformed British East India Company with 750,000 pounds of capital. But is this after the Dutch East India Company had already collapsed? No, no, no. This is like the when midst. it's the biggest thing in the okay, world. Okay, because I thought yeah. it was like they saw a train crash and they're like, let's do that. No, no, because this is like the 1650s. <laughs> right, so the when Dutch, they're in the midst. They're, they're okay. making a shitload of money, gotcha. hand over fist. So the they're British emulating success. Exactly. Much like Coke has to palely imitate PepsiCo's delicious brand. Of, or umbrella of product. Yes, yeah. yes. And much like all other tortilla chips are a pale <laughs> imitation of Doritos. Oh, just, they taste like ashes in my mouth. I know, I know. All other I, chips. Would, I would rather boil my tongue in lard. <laughs> now, Oliver Cromwell died two years after reforming the company. When a new king took over Britain, that king issued a royal decree that granted the company even wider powers to, quote, wage war, administer justice, engage in diplomacy with foreign princes, acquire territories, raise and command armies, and capture and plunder ships violating its monopoly. Wow. So the king's like, yeah. you're basically a government, but just to make money. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of jail free. Mm -hmm. Construct the laser cannons. <laughs> yeah. Well... Funny that you bring up laser cannons. Oh, boy. Because this company's new focus was not spices. The British East India Company <laughs> was not say stealing lasers, spices. Please say lasers. <laughs> the, the 1600s equivalent, oh, okay. uh, because India just happened to be the world's largest reservoir of saltpeter. Now, saltpeter forms from animal droppings after they've been left to sit and calcify for mm. a while. And it was the indispensable ingredient in gunpowder. Whoever controlled India's saltpeter supply would basically control Europe's ability to shoot people. <laughs> if you know Europe in the 1600s, yeah, yeah. shooting people's kind of their thing. Yeah. So uh, the British company focused on India and spread. By the 1700s, they had established control over three separate presidencies along the subcontinent. And these are fairly small areas. They're still just setting up trade. Sometimes they control like a city and a little bit mm -hmm. of the surrounding territory, but they're not capturing territories, right? Okay. You know, they're starting trading posts. Right. Some of those turn into cities. Some of them are based around cities, but they don't control vast swaths of land yet. And they're not saying, here are our soldiers, we own this whole city. Exactly. They're just saying, here's exactly. our little building. Here's our we, little yeah. building, we're here to trade. Cool. Uh, for now. <laughs> for now, yes. Um, Ooh, give us the give us the gunpowder. We'll, we'll just see what happens later. We'll just see what happens yeah, later. Yeah. It'll probably go great for everybody. <laughs> yeah. What we love is mutual profit. Right. <laughs> yeah. Now, the fact that Indian saltpeter was behind most of the gunpowder used in Europe's many, 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 pretty much constant and unending wars meant that the British East India Company was not the only corporate power vying for control of the subcontinent's resources. Their old enemies, the Dutch, were there, as well as French, Danish, Swedish, and Australian corporations, all fighting over the Indian saltpeter. Did these places not have animals that shit to make their not, own saltpeter? Not like if you've been to India. It's a beautiful country. 
fascinating culture. <laughs> poop everywhere? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. It will not, like, when I read, like, oh, saltpeter comes from poop and India had the most, it was, because uh, I spent a lot of time in uh-huh. it. It's like, oh, of course. Yeah, that's the place where there would be all the saltpeter. Interesting. Yeah. And they've been, you know, India's been developed for a very long time. So they right. have a long history of animal husbandry, a long history of, of, cultivation and so mm-hmm. there were just huge reserves of this stuff sitting around nice um and it just so happened that the nice. mughal empire huh? yeah. <laughs> i don't know why i said nice they have a lot of poop good yeah. for them <laughs> good for, it's not about to be good for them uh so the mughal empire who ruled most of india uh was in decline at this point um and as it declined the french and british corporations particularly grew more powerful So these corporations all had armies on the subcontinent, usually a mix of regular government troops and corporate soldiers, basically mercenaries, along with cadres of local troops trained to a rough approximation of European standards. These armies were there to defend against other corporations, but they'd sometimes make military alliances with like local princes and stuff who were more or less independent because, again, sort of the centralized nature of the Mughal Mm -hmm. government's breaking down at this point. So you've got local princes and whatnot, nawabs kind of vying for more and more control. And I'm sure the local forces they trained were just as effective as the local forces we train nowadays. You know? It's yeah. easy to transmit that kind of knowledge. It yeah. really is. Uh, so this is the world that one Robert Clive is born into in 1925. Now, have you ever heard of Robert Clive? No. He's one of the most important people who's ever lived. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, like, I mean, yes. <laughs> I know everything about him. You can skip it. <laughs> like Jan Cohen, he is a monster, but at least to me, he's also kind of a likable monster. Okay. I kind of want to see a movie about this guy. And I credit that to the decades I spent reading adventure novels set during the colonial era, like King Solomon's Mines. Clive is an objectively bad person, but holy God, he had chutzpah. <laughs> uh, so he was born into the aristocracy, but like the poor aristocracy. So you would think of this guy as like lower middle class. They got a nice house, but his dad's working all the time. And, like, he doesn't have a lot of prospects for the future. You know, while he's a kid, he keeps getting expelled from schools because he can't stop pulling pranks. Okay. Um, At one point, a bunch of his friends get together, and they form a protection racket to extort money from local business owners. So he's like a thug from a young Oh, yeah, that old prank of beating the shit out of people if they don't pay you. (laughs) Yeah. Classic Clooney. Clooney (laughs) did that on set all the time. All the time. (laughs) (laughs) This is just a prank. This is a prank. (laughs) This is a prank. Give me your money. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, Clive eventually grows up and decides to take a job in India with the company because, again, he doesn't have any prospects in England. And if you want to get fucking rich in this period, you roll the fucking die of a tropical disease dice and f- yeah. get a job with one of these you companies. You death of a salesman, it, it just go into the jungle and come out a millionaire. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the hope. Or die of mm-hmm. malaria. Or Quickly. both. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people did both. Uh, so yeah, he gets a, yeah, and he's, he's, he's not, he, the stuff that he's going to sound like an action mm-hmm. hero when we get through with this, he is a small man, he's okay. not good looking, he's sick all the time, and he is manic depressive. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I also like to think he's just a Mesaholic. He needs that mace. <laughs> he just, he's got to be where the mace no, is. No, that's further south, man. Oh, okay, We're in okay. India, although he's probably right. loving the curry. The curry powder, yeah. yeah. So in 1745, Clive gets a job working as a clerk at an outpost in Madras. He's 20. Uh, There are only about 300 guys there from the East India Corporation uh, when a force of French company soldiers shows up and tries to conquer the place. Now, the company men hole up inside the fort, but rather than fight, they just drink all of the liquor in the fort, and then once the liquor runs out, they surrender, which is... Oh, God. I can respect that, That means they probably knew they were going to surrender the whole time, but they're like, wait, wait, give us a minute. (laughs) Give us a minute. (laughs) They're probably going to take the liquor if we let them out. Exactly. So we should drink it first. (laughs) I should say... They all surrender except for Robert Clive. Oh, nice. He dresses up in the traditional outfit of a local interpreter, paints himself in blackface, and escapes with a few of his colleagues. Oh, not nice. (laughs) Not nice. (laughs) They hike 150 kilometers to the company's last intact coastal fort and get there just in time to warn them that the French army is on its way. This gives the British company men enough time to get the local ruler, the Nawab, to raise up an army of 10,000 men to defend them. So the French show up with 1,200 men, and they easily beat this army because... I Guns. wish we could know if he was manic or depressive at each time. <laughs> yeah. Like it changes. I'm guessing it in my this head. is a manic fucking <laughs> yeah. run for him. Is that diagnosable in the 1600s? How do we no, know? No, but people since then, because he wrote a lot and he had a biographer who hung out with him all the like, time. So there's yeah. enough info that people are like, it seems like he was manic it's depressive. Pretty yeah. clear. Yeah. yeah, it seems like it. Sure. You know. 
So, yeah, the uh, the French beat the army that's raised up to defend the last sort of British company port on the coast, but the delay in fighting them gives the Royal Navy enough time to show up and save the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in 1748, that little trade war ends, and Robert Clive realizes that he kind of loves being in terrifying danger, so he volunteers. Definitely manic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like I could kill a million <laughs> French guys. This is great. <laughs> this is the best. <laughs> yeah. So he volunteers for service in the militant wing of the East India Company. He basically transfers over to the armed division. Right, right. Than... Requests to be in the fighting yeah. section. Okay. And his, his request is granted because he did a really good job the last time. Uh, so he immediately gets a promotion and he winds up in a pretty sweet position where he basically gets a cut of all of the trade within a certain small area. So he starts making good money. Uh, and the thing that the trade war had driven home to Clive is that Europeans were just way better at fighting than everybody else. Um, again, that was like a 1,200-man French army versus 10,000 Indian soldiers, and it wasn't even a, a hard wow. fight. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this. You know, It's not that these guys are superhuman or genius. It's that, number one, they have guns and fairly modern gun cannons. Powder? Yeah. And number two, none of these soldiers usually want to be fighting for the side they're with. They're kind of press getting into it. These aren't large professional armies that are motivated. Right. They're just like guys this local ruler's forcing to fight, and they run pretty easy. Right, and <laughs> so come to fight yeah. another day whenever they want, yeah. Yeah, if they want, but they don't really want to fight because they're farmers. Right, that's <laughs> they're true. They're not soldiers. It kind of balances out, and but well, still. And that's the other thing is that all of the European soldiers in here are soldiers usually for decades. If they live long enough, they'll have 20 years of fighting experience. So and is it almost good. all spent overseas? Yeah. Yeah, it's not like now where they have regular, like, go home for no, your coming. Yeah, because it takes like two years to get home. It's just crazy to imagine that you sign up for... My life is just totally detached from my home now forever. Every I'm society going has into the a void. certain amount of violent, kind of off-balance people. So Europe trains them really well, <laughs> arms them, and sends them away from Europe. <laughs> like, Yeah, it's like the beginning of the space program. This is just a bunch of asshole astronauts being sent out. <laughs> we were just like, we got to get Neil Armstrong out of this fucking <laughs> yeah. planet. Like, Such a prick. S- send him away. Send him to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, this uh, this show has always had a strong anti-astronaut vibe, yeah. and I'm glad that you caught on to that. Yeah, it's you got to really hit the in every ass episode. An astronaut. Yeah. they're bastards. Yeah. Gaddafi would agree with you. <laughs> yeah, the suits. <laughs> they should all commit suicide. <laughs> yes, uh, Those, the hollow life of an astronaut, <laughs> the, the empty existence yeah, of an astronaut. I'll just kill myself. Yeah. So yeah, Robert Clive realizes that European armies are just unbelievably good compared to anything, that, particularly that the Indian rulers can put together. Um, And he realizes that with enough soldiers, there's basically no native force in India who could stop him from doing whatever he wanted. Now, he did not turn straight to conquest. He just saw this as a service he could offer the local rulers. Basically, I want trade in a certain reason. You're the guy in charge. I can help you beat whatever local enemies you have. And it won't, it's not even hard for me. I send my guys out for a couple of weeks, it's done. And then you let me get your shit at a lower price or whatever. We set up a deal. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of that's his first idea yeah. is just to set, rent his mercenaries out in order to get better trading deals. Right. Punch yeah. that guy in the face and we'll give you a Costco club card. I get it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so th- and that, that that that's when all this is happening. The empire is dying. Regional leaders are getting more and more power, and he's just renting his army out. And basically, the different European companies just start sort of backing puppet rulers in the regions mm-hmm. where they're active. Because it's easy for them to prop up a government, and it makes it easier if they can know the government's going to be supportive of their company. And they've learned from the mistake of, like, don't have your mercenaries try to turn into judges and magistrates and lawmakers and shit. Yeah. Just not, let the company remain. There's no remain. nation building yeah, here. Because like it's they, not worth the investment. Yeah, so they're leaving the state intact. They're just making sure the ruler won't do anything they don't want. Or but, knows that they'll be killed if they yeah. do. Yeah, and it's a, it's a pretty sweet position because they don't really have any responsibility over anything. Right. Like, other than fighting every now and then. Yeah, robbing people at gunpoint is yeah. usually a pretty advantageous position to be in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, at one, you know, at various points, the puppets of these corporations go to war with each other. And during one of these little trade wars uh, between the puppets of the French and the puppets of the English, like the different puppet mm-hmm. rulers they put up, uh, Robert Clive talks his way into a major military command. Uh, He takes a force of 200 English company soldiers and 300 mercenaries on a daring jungle march. They go uh, 100 kilometers in six days, and they capture the enemy capital, a town called Arcot, with 100,000 citizens. They don't even have to fire a shot. So Clive takes command of the town's fort. He orders his men not to loot or take bribes. 
Um, Because he doesn't want any trouble with the locals because he knows that there's going to be a big counterattack coming. Just to quarter. Only (laughs) quarter. Only cut them in four. (laughs) No, but he's really, he's not that kind of guy. He really is trying to win hearts and minds. He's just trying not to lose them. Okay. Because he knows the people, they don't care about the local ruler either. They're just pissed off that everything is chaotic. Chaotic. They don't care which puppet exactly. is Exactly. Yeah. And he's just like, don't give them a reason to hate us. Yeah. Like, there's there's no benefit to that. Right, right. To us in that. So, yeah, uh, Clive took, takes command of the fort. He and his men start to, like, fortify it for the counterattack, and the counterattack comes. Um, Clive and his men wind up surviving, like, a 50-day-long siege from this, like, massive Indian army. 10,000 men who have been partly trained by French soldiers, so mm-hmm. they're a little bit better than the Indian armies usually are. And they have several dozen war elephants that are covered in metal plates on their heads that are basically meant to batter down this fort. We've reached Act 3 of the movie. <laughs> yeah, we've reached Act 3 of the movie. But being a military genius, Robert Clive realized that elephants don't like being shot by rifles. Uh, so he just had his men do that repeatedly. Oh, genius. <laughs> yeah, he's a brilliant man. That wily son of a bitch. <laughs> so the muskets of that era weren't really good at killing elephants, but they scared the shit out of them, and the elephants stampeded and trampled right. the guys okay. on their own side. It's like you don't have to kill the elephant. You just have to make the elephant be like, fuck, fuck this. Fuck this. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> so the army retreats, and a few hours later, Clive and his men are relieved by reinforcements. So at this point, Robert Clive, 20-something dude, had seen more adventure than most people in two lifetimes, but he was still like, fuck it, I want more action. So he takes charge of the reinforcements, and he leads an attack on the guy who'd just been laying siege to him. Clive bribes hundreds of the enemy's best soldiers to defect and adds them to his army, and he spends the next few months just winning a series of skirmishes and slowly demolishing this Indian king's army. Uh, he Everywhere he conquered, he took bribes and cuts of all of the riches in the region and just took it. Some of it went to the company. Some of it just went to Robert Clive. So by the time this whole war is over, Clive has fuck you money. Yeah. Um, so he goes back to England for a while. Once he's out there trade... manaforting it up. Yeah. He's, mani... <laughs> he's one of the guys Manafort would be trying to burnish the image of. For right. Sure. It would be like, yeah, he was, he's a real inspiration to me. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes back to England for a while once this trade war ends, and he does the fancy rich British gentleman shtick for a spell. He gets married. He's sort of famous at this point. Um, Prime Minister William Pitt the Elder called him, quote, the heaven-born general. Mm-hmm. Uh, wealth and politics quickly grew boring for him, though. Uh, so when Clive heard the company was having more trouble with the French, he took the opportunity to go back to India and do more war stuff. So this time he winds up in Bengal, a super productive and agriculturally rich region of the country. A local nawab, his soldiers trained by the French, had just conquered the city of Calcutta, which had been sort of a British trading city, and he'd captured the English fort there. Now, the area around Calcutta had both a lot of cotton and also the world's largest reserves of high-quality saltpeter. So the British can't really afford to lose this area. So Clive takes a fleet and 200 soldiers, and he sails back to India to fuck shit up. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying Clive took it. Like the no, in, no, like the, the British East India Company defa- is like fucking England. No, 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 we're no, taking no, no. over England. No, no, no. The he's French. going in to get it back. Yeah, it gets okay. conquered by a an Indian army that's yeah. backed by the French, and the British decide to take it. back. They go easier on the ratio of elephants to soldiers. And they're <laughs> able to win this <laughs> time. Well, they, there's just not that many guys. There. <laughs> right. There's like a yeah, couple yeah, yeah. hundred dudes, right? Yeah, and they're not really well organized. So yeah, they get they get beat. So they call the sociopaths to so, come in and mop up and sociopath real <laughs> fucking hard. So Clive winds up back there, and he's, he's, he's great. You know, he, he wins a bunch of battles. He scares a bunch of elephants and makes them run through enemy ranks. That happens a number of times. Sure. It's like the classic Clive move. <laughs> uh, and the British East India Company stock raises 12% off of his victories. Uh, everything culminates in the Battle of Plassey. Now, this is one of those battles, like the Battle of Hastings, that everybody should know about. It's one of the most important moments in the history of both India and of the British Empire. So Clive, with 3,000 soldiers, only 1,000 of whom are European, fights a local army of 50,000 men, and he just wipes the floor with them. They're basically charging cannons and gun lines with swords, and it just doesn't work. Clive is not a military genius, although he gets that reputation at the time. The consensus now more seems to be that he was just competent and didn't fuck anything up and was very brave, and it wasn't hard to win a war like this, because again... You've got disciplined soldiers with muskets and cannons, and the natives are charging you with swords across an open field. As long as you're able to just barely keep them in line and yeah. be like, don't run, yeah. we'll win, yeah. you'll win. And yeah. these guys, these are all hard sons of bitches who have right. been killing people for decades, so it's they like don't Belgians run. Belgians in the Congo yeah, exactly. who have been there for fucking 15 years they, doing this shit. They are shit. rough sons of bitches. I can't even wrap my head around the mercenary concept, because I just it's so crazy to be like, hey, here's money, kill that guy. 
And then someone else comes along and they're like, here's more money. I don't know. Kill that guy. Yeah. You're like, okay. Maybe shoot this guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, money's good. Yeah. And I'm good at shooting people. Kill the guy who paid you before because here's more money. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Can I stay drunk and on opium for forever? Of course, it's the 1600s. That, is, that seemed to be like part and parcel of being a mercenary at this yeah. time. You're was just never opium. sober. Just shit in your pants, taking <laughs> opium, killing people. Yeah, that's that's these guys. Ugh. So, uh, with the victory at Plassey, Clive instantly rockets from having fuck you money to fuck the world money. <laughs> He's one of the richest humans on the planet after this. Uh, he places a new guy on the throne of Bengal, which is a huge chunk of India, and is given a cut of all of the wealth in like the wealthiest part of the Indian subcontinent. So he's given 300,000 pounds, and not pounds in terms of British currency, 300,000 pounds in gold and jewels, just for him. (laughs) Like, he just gets that loot. 300,000 pounds of shit, 150,000 tons. There's only one reason to accrue that in physical gold. Mm-hmm. He's Scrooge McDucking that shit. He There's is Scrooge no, McDucking that shit. Why would you need it as physical yeah. gold and yeah. jewels? Now, his men get a, another huge chunk of money, like mm-hmm. half a million pounds of mm-hmm. wealth. So they, they all get rich too, but not nearly as rich as Clive. And the company gets also huge, huge amounts of money. Uh, and also the British East India Company winds up with a total monopoly pretty much on high-quality saltpeter. So the British government from this point on basically has the power to cut every nation on earth off from gunpowder. Doesn't that play a key role in the American Revolution? In every war yeah. that happens Well, I since. guess that makes sense. That's the, the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian yeah. War, a big part of why the British win is because they own the gunpowder. I see. And I'm just French a musical nerd, much. so I know that 1776 yeah, song about John salt Thomas Peter Jefferson John. tells his wife how to yeah. make yeah, yeah. Self, salt Peter. Yeah. So Clive is appointed governor of Bengal, but Bengal is still technically ruled by a local dude. But for the first time, the company finds itself in control of more than just a few ports. They're more or less in control of this whole region. They're not officially. Because they don't want to be. Because they don't want to be. But they really are running this now Mm -hmm. because they think there's a lot of money in it, for one. Because they just get, as soon as they conquer it, the guy they put on the throne gives them huge amounts of money. So they start to get a taste for eating big chunks of land. Right. Okay. That's kind of where the East India Company's and nation building, or just owning them and sitting on. No, they don't give a shit about nation. Okay. 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 They just want to take the money. Um, But back at home in England, this starts to scare people. Both the company having this big chunk of land that's larger than England and contains more people in it, which Mm -hmm. is weird for everybody, and it even scares Clive a little bit. In 1759, (laughs) he writes this to a company officer: "So large a sovereignty may possibly be an object." too expensive for a mercantile company, and it is feared that they are not of themselves able, without the nation's assistance, to maintain so wide a dominion. Um, it took that long? Yeah. You I, start a business, and then you're like, we own most of Canada, <laughs> parts of Texas, and like, have we gone too far? <laughs> is this is this not what a company should no be No one asked this till now, but <laughs> should we own the moon? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we just make build a bears. <laughs> yeah, this is this has gone maybe too far for yeah. build a bear. <laughs> so the sheer amount of wealth Clive acquired in one fell swoop after the Battle of Plassey also terrifies everybody in Britain. This is a semi-modern state. We're not talking the Roman Empire where generals are meant to plunder things. This is a place with press and like civil rights rules and like limitations on the power of government and stuff. <laughs> Nothing like Clearly this. Clearly not ever... though. Or like they can be circumvented. Wait, within, within England they do. Right. Like, obviously not compared to what we'd consider, but like this is still weird for them. He's that across this guy the border just... doing crimes. So he well, gets not just doing gems. crimes. This is a officer of a corporation. Yeah. And under Clive is not just company troops, but royal British soldiers and the royal British Navy. So the British government soldiers are fighting under the command of a corporate officer who just took hundreds of thousands of pounds and plunder. This is weird for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> like, and like kept as much as he wanted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So people start to speak up and be like, this might not be OK with England. Like, yeah. we, we need to talk about this. And Bengal is not, at this point, the only chunk of land that's been taken over by corporations. We just talked about the Dutch, but obviously, like, in Canada, the American Northwest was, like, the Hudson Bay Company by this point controls a million square kilometers of North America. So it's starting to be a thing, and it's starting to get weird to people. And also, it's probably worth noting that in 1660, the British government issued a charter to the Company of Royal Adventurers Trading to Africa. Uh, This would become the Royal African Company. By 1689, the Royal African Company had shipped roughly 100,000 slaves out of Africa and into the New World. So, there it is. Yeah. 
The Dutch East India Company, the guys from the beginning, also founded the New Amsterdam colony. Their mismanagement gave it over to the English, and it eventually became New York. So, like, this is what else is happening at this time. Right. Robert Clive is back in England with all of the money in the world and starting to fend off some, like, legal challenges as a result of how much he's taken. Um, so maybe your education was different than mine, Michael, and people listening. Maybe you all learned about this stuff when you were a kid. But prior to my research here, the only thing I knew about the British East India Company was something to do with the Boston Tea Party and that they were bad guys in at least one of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, right? I knew that in in narratives of this time period, they're seen as like an evil empire. So I was ready for that to be true. Yes. And it is true. It, it's super true. And it's true that their actions built the modern world in very many ways. They embody what's possible when a gigantic business enterprise is completely unencumbered by the rule of law or conscience. But what we've seen happen here isn't just the birth of free enterprise utterly devoid of regulation, international corporations that cannot be regulated. It's not just that. This is the birth of colonialism. Because mm -hmm. this is now when these companies start thinking about colonies, not just as a place for like people to move or whatever for whatever, but like this is part of a trading empire that we've set up. And like a planned community. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, there's several movies where the evil plan is to like just reshape people on a genetic level yeah. until you have the perfect worker or whatever. And this is almost that like, let's just change the whole world, do whatever the fuck we want. Yep. Yeah. Now, in the 1850s, uh, the British annexed Mandalay in modern-day Burma. Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem about life as a colonial soldier there that I think sums up very well the attitude many of these corrupt corporate officers had towards the vast domains now under their charge. I'm just surprised the government's not already pushing back harder, like they don't see this as an existential threat. I guess because it enriches them so much, right? Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. And we'll be getting to that in the next part of this. Good. But I want to read you this quote from Kipling's poem, Mandalay, that sort of, I think it helps me get into the head of these people. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do it in a British accent. Okay, <clears throat> great. Ship me somewheres east of Suez, where the best is like the worst, where there ain't no Ten Commandments, and a man can raise a thirst. That's... That's the attitude here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's no God out here. Let's go to international waters and get drunk. Do whatever we think is best. Do whatever we fucking want. Next. Yeah. So if you want to see what it looks like when a bunch of cash-hungry corporate types winds up in charge of one of the most populous nations on the planet and realizes that there are no fucking rules about what they can do, you'll have to tune into the next episode of Behind the Bastards because this is, again, a two-parter. We will be dropping the next part on Thursday. And it's going to get ugly, not just as ugly as it's been, but as ugly as anything last century was. This so far, compared to other episodes I've heard, is tame in terms of detailed graphic detail about like, That'll individual be changing. atrocity. No! <laughs> yeah. So you're like, now you have the overview. We'll get to the blood and guts yeah. now. Yeah. So, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Mikhail, as you have never mm. gone by in my Miguelito awareness. sometimes. Yeah. So, uh, you got any pluggables before we close this episode? Well, my Twitter handle is at swaim underscore corp, but now I want <laughs> nothing to do with, I thought it'd be cute. I'm a corporation. I'm a brand, you know? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but now I realize that I'm destined to colonize the earth and crush people under my boot heel. Yes. And it doesn't feel good. No. But if you want to follow my progress on conquering the earth, that would be at swaim underscore corp. And as you mentioned at the top very graciously... Uh, our own podcast and sketch network is called Small Beans. You can find us on Patreon, Instagram, iTunes, and etc. All right. And I am Robert Evans. You can find me on Twitter at I write OK, just two letters. And uh, you can find this podcast on the internet at BehindTheBastards.com, where we'll have all of the sources for this episode and next episode. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter at, at @bastardspod. Uh, you can find us on Instagram in the same way. So thank you for listening, and we'll be back next Thursday with part two of the Age of Heroic Commerce. <laughs>